the general manager of the Sarawat Family Business Forum. I wanted to welcome you on behalf of Sarawat to uh, this fantastic talk. Uh, just for you to understand where you are, uh, the Sarawat Family Business Forum is a non-profit organization that focuses on the sustainability, innovation, and um, sustain, sorry, <laughs> sustainability, innovation, and growth of family-owned enterprises in the Middle East. So one of our missions is to have conversations about the dynamics that drive the changes in our marketplace to understand how the business of tomorrow has to act, has to manage itself in order to be able to be sustainable. So one of the things that we like to do is to include a wide range of experts to have this conversation. And since we are not selfish people, we love to share it with a wider audience. So we're very, very happy that you found your way here. I know that there is a little bit of logistical um, challenges outside, but uh, we're very, very happy that you're here with us. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight, uh, Nadine Karada. Nadine is um, a board member at Inco Group, a uh, group of companies, and a director at Growthgate Capital, and also a absolutely fantastic person, and a person that I... <laughs> I'm, I'm just putting the expectation really, really high. Um, and I'm really, really delighted that she's moderating tonight's panel because it's a topic that I think you need to come at from very, very different angles. And with the panelists that we have here today that she's going to introduce in a bit, um, I think we have this opportunity. Please engage, please feel free to ask questions. This is really a conversation that is not just focused uh, on the four people here in the front. I hope you'll enjoy it and uh, looking forward to your feedback afterwards. Thank you. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. So, are we ready for the fourth industrial revolution, which is data? Uh, I don't know if you're aware of Yuval Harari. He uh, wrote a book called Sapiens, which a lot of people know about. And they have, he has a new book called uh, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. And the first sentence in his book says, in a world deluged by irrelevant information, clarity is power. So what we want to focus on in the panel today is for you to find that clarity. I mean, this is a very big goal. I, mean, I hope you find some clarity in the whole world of big data. I'm going to introduce our speakers uh, very quickly, and then we're going to have a very short survey and then start our panel. Uh, we have Laura Shaibi with us, digital media advertising and data expert. Laura Shaibi has 20 years digital media advertising and data experience. Uh, her key industry experience is actually all the industries, media, technology, telecom, entertainment, travel, auto, fin auto finance, and e-commerce. So we're very, very happy to have you here. Then we have Al Ahmed Al Hururi, asset performance management practice lead from GE Digital. Uh, he works with engineering to define and deploy reliability and performance ana analytics for power plants based on the GE Industrial Internet of Things. So with Ahmed, we'll focus more on like how can we change a big company from uh, being an industrial company to more of a digital company. And then we have Rishi Kaitaran, who is our serial entrepreneur in the panel. He set up Game World in 1992. And then uh, in 2015, Rishi had the vision that the future of distribution will be controlling and optimizing the supply chain to e-commerce companies. So he set up another company called Jeff Commerce, where he works with B2B to optimize their uh, e-commerce side of it. So we're going to start quickly with a survey. I mean, nothing. You're just going to show of hands, just to understand that we can adapt our panel more to the audience. Uh, so who's here in startup or close to startup? Three. <laughs> okay. Inspirational startups. Uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, I think we're in an option. Who else? Who else? Uh, next, who here is from a corporation? Like a big corporation. And uh, <laughs> who here, because of Sarawat, we need to respect the space. Who here is from a family group? And now we're going to go quickly on industries so that we can uh, adapt based on industries. Who works mostly in media? Okay. 
e-commerce. No one's making money. No. <laughs> Industry, construction. I feel like I, I missed the whole uh, healthcare, you know, education, retail. Okay. Well, uh, Are there any uh, major categories we missed? Uh, food. Real estate. Real estate. Ah, real estate. We're all unemployed looking for jobs here. <laughs> okay, and please ask questions during uh, during the panel so it doesn't become uh, boring. We definitely don't want a boring panel. Okay, to start off, we wanted to first understand why what is big data and why has it become important in the last 10 years. Uh, Laura, if you'd like to. Uh, can you hear me? Do I need the mic? Oh wow. Yes. Okay. I'll use mine. I think so. Maybe from down. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I decided to go first because in the 90s, it was the first time a computer took my job. And I was working for a data driven company uh, called Axiom at that time, which was a, it's a, it started as a direct marketing specialist. And I used to know the performance of what I was doing. I was on a helpline, believe it or not. I used to be Google before Google, giving advice on tourism uh, to Australia, to the UK market. And I had to answer every single call in less than one minute and 30 seconds. I took about 120 calls a day. If I couldn't answer your question in one minute and 30 seconds, I needed to take your details, hang up, and call you back. I had a reference library wall about the, the width of that back wall. And about 70 to 85% of the questions could be answered by one fulfillment, which was the annual magazine. And when they did all of the analysis, they worked out you actually don't need humans to answer questions. And interactive voice recognition services took my job in 1999. So I've been out running how data is used to disintermediate people from their jobs for 20 years. <laughs> So what is the difference between data and digital? This is probably one of the biggest questions I'm faced with every single day in my career because I say I'm a digital expert, I'm not a data expert. And how I explain it is, imagine, and I'll use a lot of analogies, if you're someone who skis, the snow is like data, meaning it's relatively static, you can navigate down it, and you can master skiing. If, however, you're someone who is a surfer, the water and the waves is like digital. It's dirty, it's temperamental, it's pretty much uncontrollable, but you can still learn how to navigate it. But typically people who ski cannot always surf, and people who know how to surf really think skiing is boring. That's how I kind of explain the difference between digital data and data, data or structured data. So the question was how has things changed in the last 20 years, obviously it's gotten bigger. What is the definition of big data? To me it's very simple. If your personal computer can no longer handle it, it's pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you need some help. So I'll pass on to some of the other guys to talk about a little bit about transformation. It's not going to go away. It is going to get bigger. It is a lot more signal data, which is structured data that's growing in volume. Digital, though, is it's a different kind of data, and for those who want to know more about it, we can certainly discuss it. all the pricing, all the volume, 
and then it becomes very, very big because you can measure a lot of volume and it's, it's in incredible how much data there is. So to give you an example, an, an, a normal e-commerce site, like um, if you see currently, um, Souk announced that they started the global Amazon store by adding 1 million consumer products, which people think, wow, that's a lot. But there are more than 400 million consumer products at this moment worldwide. And try to measure that, that's big data. Thank you. To go to our second question, what is the power of this data disrupting the status quo? How does it really change the way we do things every day? If you can give us some examples, Ahmed? Yeah, of course. So, uh, again, my background is slightly different from the other two panelists, so come strictly from engineering background. Uh, from what we've seen in engineering, that you can easily get a productivity close to 1 to 5%. And again, in engineering and industrial space, that means around maybe $5 million a day for some people in some industrial spaces. Uh, in some other spaces, you can get up to $10 million a day. So having that productivity without doing anything, technically speaking, from an engineering standpoint, I didn't change a screw, I didn't get a new piece of equipment, I didn't spend a lot of capital expenditure to get that extra 10 million dollars it's amazing just to see that productivity and just understanding your data and making decisions based on that only you can easily get that extra productivity of you know 10 million dollars a day so that was extremely insightful <coughs> and that's how we driven from general electric standpoint we are generating from our insert around 30 percent of the total power generation of the world so think of it that most probably 30% of this room are getting their power from here. So that being said, we're talking about an immense amount of data that we were landing around 100 terabyte data per day. So we started analyzing that data and decided to see what can we do from there. And we started get, changing our jobs from rather than making decisions and just maintaining our machines every you know cycle time, every six months, every year, to when these machines need maintenance. And that's the critical change of status quo previously, and you've seen that in car manufacturers as well. You would do maintenance of your car every you know ten thousand kilometers or so. But the next thing is, rather than doing that, when the car needs oil change, when the car needs uh, some specific maintenance on the engine or so on, the car will tell you that and you take it to the service. Do only, rather than paying a huge amount of, you know, sum of money for maintaining everything, you're just maintaining what the car needs to maintain for an extra thing. Rishi, if we can speak with you about the impact of actually not having data or not using data in the company so in, in our case if you don't use data you limit yourself and you limit your potential and i think that's that's the worst thing you can do for yourself and for your company because you want to keep developing yourself so if you see in our company you know uh, who plays video games only a few i don't think <laughs> that, you know that more than 52 percent of the gamers are women it's only data it's database so if, if you love games it's very easy to become a video game salesperson and then you start selling video games because you love FIFA, Call of Duty or Mario Bros and you specialize in it. But you become an expert in one field, so you start selling to all those retailers and e-commerce uh, people. But if you use data, you can suddenly see that there's a much bigger market there. Not only video games related, but also merchandise related. Or you suddenly see when you sell perfume or we sell party products or we sell different type of products which are not related to your product groups that you're able to sell a lot more and grow your company much faster. So to give you an example, my company had only had an assortment of 10,000 products. Now I have almost 4 million products. So my capacity to sell, you know, is almost 100 times more than it was before. Okay, so I'm gonna add to this more from what you might want to do in the audience. The way I think about digital and data is there's two stages. The first is what I call the digitization of your business. And this is going back to your businesses tomorrow and saying, what are we still doing manually? What are we still doing where it's paper trails? And how can we turn that into a digital solution? 
and it's very small wins. It's actually the 1% every day that you do towards your businesses that will get you to where you need to be. So like, for example, if you have expenses that you have to claim and you're a small business, don't wait till the end of the year to hand all those receipts over to an accountant. Get a downloaded app that takes a photograph of the receipt and that can actually calculate how much have you paid in VAT so you can do a VAT uh, credit return. Are, are you overspending in coffees per month? Actually, are you buying too much paper for your business and you want an objective of getting less paper down so you get cost efficiencies? Start first and foremost in the data world with the digitization of your business. The second phase is what is called digitalization. And this is where you may start right now, many of you probably have businesses where what you're doing is what I call backwards glancing reporting. You get to the end of the week, the new week starts, you get last week's reports, and you're always looking at the past to assess what happened, to then go, okay, what should we do in the future? What the difference is with digitalization with businesses is you're no longer looking at the past, you're looking at information in its real time, and then you build in the infrastructure to help you get into a situation where you're scenario planning, or the systems are scenario planning, what will our future look like? And I will tell you, every single major business has gone through this painful process. It is a painful process. In fact, I've got colleagues who I've worked with in the last 10 years in the room who were also with me at one of my digital companies. I've worked for BBC, AOL, France Telecom, Yahoo, I'm now at NBC. And what we had to do as an example is we actually had a business unit called Easy to Do Business With. And what they had to do is they had to deconstruct step by step by step, how long does it take to do something? So I'll give an example. Let's say you want to sell a product to a customer. How many steps is there in between the first contact with that customer to receiving the money? Now hopefully it's receiving the money and then paying your BAT submission, but I think in this country you might be paying your BAT and then getting your money. We found as a business that that process was over 45 steps. If you're going to be a digital business, you cannot take 45 steps between the first contact with the customer and the final point of transaction. It might be there's an approvals layer that is actually slowing you down. Well then, make it an automated approval or make it 24 hours. If you're not replying in 24 hours, then you're not part of the approvals. Sorry, you're actually slowing down our ability to meet our customers' needs. The success of data and digital transformation, that's the best examples I can give, is, is just try and incrementally pull one process out at a time that is slowing down your business's ability to do business. And when you work that way, you start to see inefficiencies everywhere. The worst is like when you go to a restaurant, why don't they just put ketchup on the table? Why does I have to wait five minutes for the waiter to order the little container of ketchup, they go back, they give me a little ramekin of ketchup, they gave me too much ketchup, so now they're probably spending 5% worth of their budget inefficiently on ketchup I didn't use. These are small wins that actually help businesses get into profit margins. Yeah, I think I think we are sold on big data now, and we, I think we realize that it improves productivity by five, six percent. And I really like how you've given like small, you know, easy to do examples. So well, let's say, okay, I want to bring this either to my company or to my team. Now, when I go tomorrow, what are the things, what are the steps that I can take to start, you know, bringing it and implementing it in the company? Ahmed, for example, you lived through GE from being, you know, a big corporation with nothing digital to becoming a digital company. Yeah, so like Laura's, you know, she touched on an important aspect, which is digitization and digitalization. So we, that's exactly what we started. So we have literally that specific training assigned to everybody in the corporation to understand those two words and how to apply them into day-to-day -day -day lives. So that's the very, very, very first step is availability or visibility of the data that you see. And that's from a corporation, that's how we start. Let's first get visibility on our existing processes and our existing 
uh, go-to-market strategies, our existing uh, technologies, and try to drive it by having incubations. So, hey, if you have an idea to digitize something that you're doing today or improve it, tell it. We're going to incubate your idea and take it to the next step. Again, from a corporate perspective, that gives the feeling of startup within the corporate so that you get that, hey, um, as a person or two people, a team of two, I just changed how my commercial team is working, how my operations team is working, which spikes a lot of creativity and improves the talent within the teams. So that's the very, very step that we, very first step that we did. And then we started establishing a whole digital business. And that digital business started, again, we rendered it in three phases. GE for GE, so we're doing digital for, sorry, uh, digital for GE. So we're improving ourselves through what we believe in. Once we started success, seeing success there, we started seeing spikes of productivity around you know, workshop floors. And that's the very first thing that we've seen it. Hey, workshop floors are not digitized. There is a lot of inefficiencies. There is a specific you know, piece of the workshop that it's not there. Sometimes in summer it comes that you get the same type of failures so often. And if you don't have that visibility, you wouldn't know to order that part quite often, right? So you order that in advance. Uh, so this is the biggest one. And then the next step is, let's try to sell what we did. So GE for our customers. And then we started seeing, again, working with our customers. Again, first step, get your data connected, get visibility. So again, start with your data. And if you think of it, it's pretty simple. We all have that day in, day out. We're just not doing it enough. So, for example, if you see your car, again, simple reference, uh, if you understand how often does your tire pressure drop and how often do you need to inflate your tires, it's a very simple thing, it might be not costly either, but if you understand how often you're doing it, what's the typical gauging, you know, it increases a little bit in summer, it decreases a little bit in winter, things like that, you start getting visibility on are you over retaining your tires? Are you letting your tires a long time during winter because I'm not driving that much, I'm using the metro or whatever, or summer, um, my family's on vacation, so I'm not driving that much just from work and back. So things like that, I would see, hey, I wouldn't want to inflate my tires because that decreases pressure, da, 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 da. So things like that we started seeing and started improving mm -hmm. from a corporation perspective. And then from there, we started gauging the productivity that we're getting, and then started putting numbers on it. And once you do that, you have a lot of people jumping on. I think an important point here was is that every guy, everybody got educated. 100%. And uh, so everybody needs to understand what this transformation means, even though it doesn't directly affect you. Uh, Rishi, you had mentioned about setting up, for example, from where this change should come. Yeah, so I, th I think what's very important with this change, it starts at the top. So it's the CEO, the board, or the family member who owns the company, you know, we really need to say, we're going to change and we're going to use data. That's the first step, because if they don't stand behind it, it's not going to happen. The second thing is then he needs to give a mandate. It can be within the company or outside the company. So I like those examples which you gave me before. We, I did the same thing within my company. I set up a department and the department was big data and company optimization. So there are dedicated people, different departments, and the only job was look within the companies for inefficiencies and apply that you know, and make them better. Uh, the problem with that uh, as a different department is sometimes people don't like those departments because you have somebody from another department going to say, you're not doing your job very well. You know, so that, that can be a big Or I'm gonna replace your job. Yeah, we're gonna replace your job, yeah. So, so that, that can be a big, big problem. So, and, and the third thing is that we, what we also advise, or what I say to people, the next thing that would be maybe put that department as a different business unit. The reason why is keep it independent. So it's an independent business unit in a conglomerate or a bigger company, and they can interact again with external partners, external advisors, and as their own company, you know, within the group, they can optimize or create their own, uh, own products. And why I think it's more important, and especially very important in Arabic families and Arabic conglomerates, is because most of the time, the business units are being owned or driven or managed by family members. So are you going to tell your uncle, uncle, you're not doing it right, or, you know? <laughs> 
There are lots of things. Exactly, you know. So, so uh, uh, to give you a recent example, uh, I've met, I, I went to an Arabic family very recently and I was talking about data and how data analytics would change the company. And in this case, the, the company had more than $35 million in bad stocks. Stock which is lying around, which is not, is not being used and just wasting money in, in that sense. And the board were the younger generation and the older generation. The younger generation really loved it, they wanted to start it, but the older generation, well, I don't understand it, I don't get it, so we're not going to do it. You know? So that needs to be really separated. And the, the way I would do it, I would tell the families, make it a separate business unit, bring it in a positive way, tell them this is going to generate money for all of us. Don't tell people, you know, or judge people from the past, tell them, you know, this company is going to find things which are, not, which are not so good, but all of us are going to benefit. So it's only, we're only going to find the positive elements from it and let that division report directly to the CEO so the CEO can see you know, what's happening because the CEO can see the wins and he can really mandate it more within the company. And worse come to worse, let's say that fails, then it's just one of the ventures which fails. It doesn't matter. But embrace the change, embrace data. Rishi, do you want to go to this family business and <laughs> <laughs> Thirty-five million dollars. <laughs> let me, let me be like, it's okay if it fails, no problem. <laughs> like, like, let me give you an example. At NBC, when I came to NBC, we used to have calendar day holiday days. I'm from Canada. It takes a whole day to get there and two days to get back. If you were to take a Thursday off on its own, it's one holiday day. If you took a Wednesday, Thursday is two. But if you took a Thursday and a Sunday, your weekends were holiday days. Now that just doesn't add up to me. So it was very simple. I said to the head of HR, I was like, have you ever done the analysis to see how many people take a sick day on a Thursday oh, God. and the weekend is not counted up as holiday days? And sometimes what you need to know with data is you don't come to the business with a data opportunity. You come with a data opportunity that mitigates risk. Okay? And I said, it's very simple. Show the CEO what is the opportunity cost from the number of days that people are in relationship to the other five day, four days of the week, taking a six day, six day on a Thursday, add up how much is that to the business and the cost of, of salaries that is now unproductive, and see if you think that it's worth it to change your policy on going to um, just normal work days as your days off. And within 12 months of me joining, the policy was changed after 24 years. I'm also so, the four day also so, the new <laughs> No, I was like, you mean if I take a Thursday and a you, So everyone gains the system true. and it's comes true. back on the Thursday, or they call in sick on the Thursday and they stay in their home country and then they come back on the Sunday. That's true. And so really sometimes in this region, your best cases is, is either shaving them into the, the risk of, if we don't do this, this is, what's gonna happen, as opposed to, hey, we could do this, and this is kind of cool, and it might make us look good. Another one that works is like, my competitor, the competitor is doing this, we have to do it. That's also one of them. Yeah. To go now to industries, uh, Laura, what do you think, I mean, I'm, I'm only gonna put 10 years, because things are changing so quickly that 10 years might be a big impact. What do you think media is gonna look like in 2028? She said 2028, by the way, not 2020. Um, you know, the interesting thing about media is now every industry wants to have a piece of media, meaning like retail as entertainment, uh, trying to get entertaining messages into your communication strategy to encourage people to get their attention. And it's almost disappointing that a lot of our communications are trying to gain the system as opposed to important factual information, which has been extremely marginalized because we don't know what is factual anymore. I think the biggest things that are coming up in the next 10 years is if you're not thinking about voice activated services now, then you run a risk of really being impacted. And let me give you some context. I used to work supporting search as a business function uh, when I was at Yahoo. And to give you an idea, 5% search share uh, compared to Google's 95% was 50% of our revenue. So even a small share was extremely massive. And the positioning of search was always against the shelf space. So when you go to a grocery store, you would tell food and beverage and, and other FMCG brands, hey, Mr. Food and Beverage and FMCG brand, 
you've got two rows at line sight that you're paying a ridiculous amount of money for, competing with everything else in the shop, come in to search and you've got unlimited shelf space. Just make sure you're on the first page. And if you're in the top three, it's an 85% chance you're going to be chosen. So you have all of us in this room who've now designed our SEO strategy, search engine optimization, if anyone's not in marketing, or search engine marketing, and now there's apps and you're trying to do app store optimization to know how can your app be found organically without having to pay money. But what will happen now is we have been programmed to infinite shelf space. And with voice, that infinite shelf space is going to be smaller than the physical shelf space of one return. And there will be generations that grow up that these voice assistants will be their source of truth. Okay? Like I have a friend who said, oh my God, the other day, my daughter asked me, it was the weekend, Daddy, can we go to Legoland? And she says, no, sweetheart, sorry, it's closed today. Uh, Alexa, what day is Legoland open? So now dad is a liar. <laughs> okay, but no, I know this sounds funny, but their source of truth is going to be a commercially driven voice making commercially driven decisions to encourage people down a certain path. And in the USA, I can tell you now, there are already software companies that know how to hack into these voice services, redirect the question's answer back into a hacked version of the answer. So if you say, what is the best flower shop to go to in Al Wassel? These systems in the USA are already learning how to reprogram a commercially viable alternative response. Okay, so if you now are not the number one choice, you are not even an option to a voice assistant. So we decided not to scare them, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry, you need to be scared. You need, you need to yeah, be scared. Yeah, no, we have to be aware like, of it, definitely. Like, this is, this is, this is, you know, you will read by 2020, half of all searches are voice activated searches. How do you ensure you are the choice of return? And it will become more confusing because as Amazon comes into the market more, there is auto complete on the basket. There will be auto order. They have physical buttons in people's houses where you don't even have to order. Alexa, put this in my basket. Yes, when do you want it delivered? If you're in a path for purchase cycle and Amazon is in your industry, I hope to goodness that you are friend with them. Yeah, and, and, and to add to that, there's two things with, the, with the, the Alexa. It, it, it is a debate going on that children need to say please to Alexa, be kind, otherwise they get roots to normal people. Because <laughs> how do you distinguish as a child or normal people, you know, or, or between a machine? But going on the Amazon, I think in, two, in ten, time, 10 years from now, you're going to get your order delivered before you know you would need it. That's where we're going towards. You know, you're talking about the dash button, the auto delivery. And the reason why that's happening is because we're giving so much data away. So, who of you have gone to Dubai Mall recently? Yeah, so if, if you're going to Dubai Mall, you probably saw the Emirates uh, logo always around, and now you can, uh, you can get Emirates uh, miles if you buy uh, products in Dubai Mall. So, who used the service? a few. So why do you think they give that away to you? What, what's the reasoning behind it? Any, any idea? Why do they give you those mouths? They want my behavior. They want your behavior. So to give you an example, if, oh, if the, moment, the moment you, you download that app and you link your Emirates accounts to the Dubai uh, mall app, think about it. Amar or Emirates will know where you came from, on which flight, what kind of Class you came to, are you economy class, are you business class, are you first class? It's already a lot of data. How many frequent flyer miles do you have? How much frequent do you fly? So they already have you segmented. Then you come in there, you start scanning all those receipts. So I was doing it because I love to see how it is and I, and I love Emirates. <laughs> now, and then I was, when I was doing it, I was thinking, oh, now they know the size, the size of my wife's clothes, they know where I'm buying stuff, they know my favorite restaurant. They know, you know, whatever I'm paying, am I a cheap guy or am I an expensive guy? They know everything from me. And here comes the third thing. If you use the Facebook, the Facebook login, you're really dead. Because then they know everything from you, you know? They can relate it everything to your friends. So you think about it, it's not about loyalty, it's all about data and capturing you. And, and that's where the future is going to go to.
and it's about using that data to make more money, okay? <laughs> We're going to find a way. <laughs> yes, I hope so. Now to go to our last questions and then we'll open to Q&A, which is more of a soft uh, skill question. Especially in our world here, uh, experience means a lot. I have 10 years experience, I have 20, I have 40 years experience. My intuition tells me everything. But now with machine learning and AI, intuition means nothing anymore because a machine can give you intuition. Do we think there's gonna be a management revolution? Is the leader now the leader we want in 10 years? Right. So I just goes to all of you. <laughs> okay, so if you don't want that, I can start on this one. So, I mean, engineering field is all about experience and intuition of the engineer. That's what it's built on. That's how it's, how it's evolved to what it's been. The engineer doesn't work on it, intuition, but yeah, over, you're all time, about science. <laughs> over time, you build that intuition. You would know, hey, this number doesn't seem right, mm. or this process doesn't look right. I've done it so many times. It's always above X. If you're below X, you did something wrong, right? What we've seen, and this is where we've been working, hey, I tell you, this X, you know what, for the past 50 years, you've been doing it wrong, I'm sorry. It should be less than that by 5%. And then when you tell that to 50 years, double PhD in his field, it's offensive, right? So you're just telling him you've been doing your job wrong for 50 years. But I would tell him, you know what, this is the data for the past 50 years, that number is 5% above what you actually needed. If you decreased it by 5%, you just saved yourself this much money. So that intuition, and we've seen it specifically in the region, this younger generations are open to that. Open to see, okay, show me engineering. So do a simulation, which is something that we didn't, we weren't aware for. And the new management comes with, okay, you're telling 5% is fine, lower 5%, if we lower this margin by 5%, I'm still gonna be fine. Do a full simulation for me and show me what's gonna happen. And then you open an era of digital things. So you simulate your whole world, if it's a building that you're building, if it's a car that you're driving or whatever. So you simulate the whole thing. And you say, see, it's gonna run for another 20 years, you're fine. So that open to experience and, and openness from a management perspective, yeah. that doesn't mean that you're gonna replace the management or gonna replace the guy that said it's an X value. That guy is now gonna be open to understand why it's X minus Y and how can they improve on that and how can they understand from a different perspective. So at least from an engineering standpoint, this is how we've seen it transform in the past couple of years or three years. Do you want to talk money and want to talk feelings? <laughs> <laughs> Let's finish it with feelings, I think. <laughs> so, um, if you look about automations versus human control, I think there's one thing we need to forget. That automation is also a big trend. And the problem is, is even if I see it in my own company, the more you automate, the less people know. Because everything goes on its own, you know? And so sometimes people don't know anymore how processes work. And, and give you a few examples of why it's a big threat and why you always need humans to know what's going on or to validate. is because when computers take over, the role changes. And um, a few examples of this is that we figured out two years ago that Amazon makes the algorithms by the S team. There's one team in the United States which is called the S team, which is the Superman team. So they own the algorithms, which means within such a huge company, if you are dealing with an account manager of Amazon, they don't know anything about the system and how things work. So if you're talking to them, they say, oh, we need to ask, I don't know how it works. So that's a big problem because we also figured out that Amazon, when they do buying, they don't respect the retail prices. So when they see a demand coming up, they're even willing to buy above retail price. So think about it. If the retail price is $100, normally buying price is $80, and they need to uh, uh, you know, fill supply, we can still sell it at $120 and they still sell it at $100. You think? And why is that? Because it's all automation which is coming back and forward. So they didn't see this for months. So we were very happy, you know, eventually they saw it. You know? But it's all about not somebody having a human controlling those, uh, those aspects. And uh, another reason was is that, is that uh, we, we made an interface with Amazon and normally we need to update the delivery statuses in Europe, you know, when is product going to be available. 
And one of our IT vendors could send a message made a mistake. So we didn't update it on the back end. And so what happens for days, we were confirming orders for the products which we didn't have. Even Amazon didn't notice this. But suddenly, for 200 million consumers, around 2 million products throughout Europe were wrongly, <laughs> you know, monitored on the What's website. It? it wasn't a phone, was it? No. <laughs> <laughs> So, so sometimes it's very, very strange. So you need to have people thinking about, you know, what the heck are we doing it? You know, and not leaving everything to the algorithms because they can each other. So I'm in the world of media, and media is run by humans mostly. Although some of you may not be aware that in Japan there was a book that was written all through automation, and it actually won a best book prize. So. From the text world, automation and the ability to deliver creativity can be deconstructed and reconstructed for, um, by machines. In the audiovisual world though, the reality is, is that what really challenges digitization and digitalization are humans. Because we are made of carbon, we are not fiber. And we are analog, we are not digital. And we are irrational. We are the anti-objective machine that we're building to take over the things that shouldn't really matter to us anymore. And in the media world, and in the media communications world, I'm in a business where our media is pretty much free, which means every day you need to think of your business that at midnight, the clock resets, and you have to re-win over your audience for your free services every single day. We're not even trying to get money from you. Well, we are, but through advertising. In the world of media, what I've seen, and there's some great case studies on the internet, is data, believe it or not, as much as I sit on the biggest data sets in the world, I deconstruct Netflix, and I know that Netflix has nearly 45,000 pieces of metadata to decide which 50 programs to put in front of you per genre, and 15% of the catalog that you're seeing on a daily basis. I have the big, biggest database in the world called Tubular Labs that I use every single day to help my business understand its success in the socialized media world. What videos are being uploaded in a 10 second delay on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, AOL, Daily Motion, and Twitch, and unfortunately Snap is on a separate platform because they're immature. <laughs> this is the size of data. This is my, my playpen of data. And you've asked me, is intuition going to lose its finesse in the media world? I don't think you can live without it. And what I have seen and, and what I actually have to say as someone who sits on data, the data will help you deconstruct why we think something was good, but in the creative world, the combination of that understanding and your creativity and understanding human nature and human truths is the construction of media. Now, if it's a pragmatic or objective piece of media, like I'll give an example. In 2014, when I left the UK to come here, there was something called smart ads. And a smart ad, I'll give an example. If you're like an airline industry, you will have destination, you will have price point, you will have message positioning, and you will have a time frame. So like, uh, 24 hour sale today with Emirates to Barcelona for uh, 900 euros. In 2014, we were creating with machines about 125,000 versions of that ad and with the machines and the data. The data is really metadata, it's keywords. Okay, the, what is data? It's, it's words or price points, depending on how many fields you have. So in 2014, there was 125,000 variants being made in five minutes. Now, I, I judge Data Creativity Awards. Last year, the airlines had 1.5 million versions of their ads that are smart ads because they are continually 1% per day adding more important pieces of information to define how to optimize this communication to encourage you down path to purchase. Is that intuitive? No. But if you want to do long form, long term, longitudinal relationships as opposed to short transactions, absolutely intuition is still going to be key. So I, I have a, a
follow up and a, a doubt about this. Um, okay, so younger generations, what got me to really use things like Talabat and Zumato and things like that is I don't need to go through that long process. That's something that I just, it's easy to go pick what you want and I don't want anybody to talk to me. I don't want, hey, we have this extra thing if you want to buy, you want extra whatever on this, or well, you want this with your order. So for me, if you customize this for me, and once I open the app based on analysis and you would know, you know, I had a hard day, it's late in the day, and you just tell me, hey, it sounds like you probably need this. You want to eat burger now, so there you go. That's your typical burger order. Go ahead. Most of them that like that better, to be honest. And and we we can see that evolving over time, even the media. So you can see right now, once you open any digital media or newspaper website or whatever, they will tell you I'm gonna enable cookies, and that's exactly what it's doing is it's analyzing how much you're spending on the piece of the article. So are you spending your time just on the abstract? Are you reading through it and so on? And if you close that open it again, or go to a platform that is compatible with it, you're gonna see the ad is changing to something that is customized to you. So if you're a person that reads a lot, most probably the ad is gonna be a book. If a person just reads the abstract and skips over, that is gonna be something to buy, or a tablet, or an app. So these kind of things in digital media, and then there is companies like Vox, that you know, the digital media that now are generating their videos that is telling the news. So it's analyzing the news, analyzing the headlines, and generating a one minute video of the relevant headlines. Oh yes, for sure, transactional things, absolutely. But let's take, for example, Amazon creating a political series and uh, NBC creating a, a long drama series scripted. Scripted. Okay. And then equally Netflix doing the same thing. There's a great video online that said both, for example, Amazon and Netflix used data to deconstruct what makes for excellent political programming. Look, Amazon used data to design the entire deconstruction and reconstruction okay. of their show. What Netflix did is they deconstructed, well actually, what's the best director based on our data? Mm -hmm. What is the best talent? based on our data. Mm -hmm. And then they used the producers and the script writers with their toolkit of what was best of the best to make more um, House of Cards. And, yeah. and when you see the comparison of the deconstruction, reconstruction as a data-led strategy in right. media, and the deconstruction, and then the insights applying the business acumen in media, right. we're talking transaction-based and low involvement goods, but for media, Typically, the business acumen at the moment with the insights right. is what is leading material. Yep. Now, there's one other thing I need to say about Netflix and all signal data that is very, very misleading. Right now, people are using their mobile phones, and I've done a lot of work in research, including neural impact on device usage with the University of Toronto, trying to understand the ability to remember things when you're using a mobile device. When you are stimulating multiple numbers of your senses and holding a device is the touch sensation, this sensation actually is giving you a dopamine hit into your brain. And this is a, the reward drug, and it's an instant gratification drug. And the, the kind of counterpart for long-term trust emotions is serotonin or oxytocin. And what will happen, this is my 10 years out, is that oxytocin Voice services today are being specifically designed to trigger the oxytocin in the next generation's body to trust that voice more than the dopamine hit that they're getting from their mobile phones. Okay. <laughs> so when you think of the programming that's being made today, it is based on signal data, including even Facebook. All of these signals that we're giving is the dopamine correlation of what defines success. Why are the games getting more difficult to play and more stimulating? Because they're dopamine. What did Netflix succeed in? Dopamine hitting programming. They know the key moments in their programming that they're making with their originals that really stimulate dopamine. But what they have to do now is work out all of the other range of emotions where digital does not give you signal data. 
And this is where the world of research will have to come back into play. So I guess what we learned from this panel is data is important for our business, but we're also controlled by it. Not that nobody calls cities, but uh, and Netflix and Amazon are evil. <laughs> okay, to bring it back. So the question was about optimization for those of you who couldn't hear. When have you gone too far with your optimization? Okay, so again, not to scare anyone, but... Uh, <laughs> I think so, that's already done. Yeah, so <laughs> there is AI, so newer nets, if you've heard about it, and for the people that didn't hear about it, it's a simple algorithm that it teaches itself. It keeps on evolving automatically, and keeps, you give it just a function to evaluate itself. Did it do good or did it do bad? So what it does is randomly, and it's truly random, generates a new generation, and out of that generation, it evaluates itself, and only the best function, again, evaluates more, so creates its next generation. What this has been seen in multiple researches and Hopefully I can share that with you afterwards. It came up with ideas that are performance enhancing that, to be honest, we wouldn't think of. Like having an extra piece that, in a typical, it's just extra hardware, it's gonna weigh you down and so on from an engineering standpoint. But in retrospect, it's actually improving your aerodynamics more than it's adding weight. So, hey, it's better. So a car industry which looked the same forever, now you've got an extra piece in it just because of that AI piece from an optimization standpoint. So that being said, if you optimize for a single aspect, then you're always going to be dragging to that certain aspect. However, So, so, so you're right, it, it, we, we use a focus strategy and it's not only about pricing, it's about supply chain management because we see there's a lot of differences in, in supply chain optimization because people think about e-commerce always about the lowest price, but data shows it's not about the lowest price, it's about availability. You want to have that instant gratification, you want to have it, it available. So, uh, whereby you would think, you know, from data, you know, you learn how to sell more, how to sell easier, you know, we can show to people you have lost so much money because you didn't have that product in stock or this brand has lost so much money because they couldn't reach these customers. Or it, it shows, give an example, we are distributor of Everlast, which is the number one boxing uh, uh, product. Uh, I had a presentation yesterday with a big e-commerce retailer here, and I explained to the board that, you know, you are one of the biggest retailers here in, in the Middle East, but you only have 200 Everlast products, even though there are 3,000 in Europe. That's a big gap in there. So, so there's so many different business models in your one field that we would rather focus and uh, becoming Terminator, I leave to this guy, you know? Um, the question was about optimization and when is it too far, yeah? Okay, so let's go back into future-facing things. So, and specifically I'm gonna talk about retail now. In China, Jack Ma, the last two years has been positioning the new world will be something called he calls new retail and what you need to know is that in digital the experience that you have with the product is called UX or usability and design and the philosophy of usability and design is being able to design this experience for the for the one-to-one the -one relationship so it's my personalized experience made for me I feel very very intimate with with my ability to order my Taliban and it to remember exactly how I like my uh, curry. <laughs> now, in the physical world, the principles of design are the complete opposite, and it's called customer experience, or CX. And the philosophy of CX 
is the other way. It's how do I design a universal experience so that every single person can obje like objectively or, or, or be able to achieve their goal. So like for example, when you're going to the airport, the moment you get out of the vehicle to the time you get onto your plane, that airport needs to make sure 100% of people passing through the airport can achieve their goals. And so the, the next 10 years, what is happening is these two principles that are really extremely polarized are going to be crushed together. And what that means is it's much like the mall example where the physical reality is a universal experience, but within that universal experience, you can go in and transact in a personalized way. So the first industries that are moving into this are the luxury industries. They call it clienteling. Hi, Mrs. Jones. It's great to see you today. We've got the new line of Chanel in your size eight. <laughs> or whatever that clienteling experience is. What will make or break those business models, country by country by country by country, will be around what's called in marketing a pestle analysis, which means what is the political infrastructure supporting so right now the EU is actually retroactively going, hey, you can't have my data. By the way, I love saying under GDPR, take me out of the database. Um, whereas China, it's the complete opposite, where you're literally living 1984. There are now people who are like delivery guys with a social rating on how well they are for what they're doing, and the mother won't let the daughter date the guy until she sees his Alibaba, almost like an Uber ratings score. Okay, so this is like, you got, that's the political, economic framework. Is there the money in the country to support these kinds of processes at a government level? Here, this is a focus. The social level. Are our societies willing to adapt? We've got, you know, women driving in Saudi. We've got cinemas opening. We just had the first Cirque du Soleil live event for Saudi National Day um, with, with co-gender attendance. We've got a few more minutes. All of these things, so the political, economic, social, technological, legal, educational framework, all of these will be the framework that will help you understand how quickly or not quickly countries will be adopting these changes. So, and, and to add to this strategy, it's not, you, you need to look at data as gold. When you're mining for data, you're mining for gold. But when you start mining, probably you find some diamonds, you find some silver, you start finding new things and suddenly you have new business units. So the best way to look at it, look at an Amazon. It started as a retailer, but because it's not a retailer, and not an e-tailer, it's an e and data company. Based on all the data, they started making so many different business units, and that's why it is, I wouldn't say it's an evil company, it's a data company. And because it owns data, and it garners data in such a big way, and so fast, it can enter into market much faster than anybody else. And that, that makes it a little bit unstoppable, and that makes it maybe a little bit evil. You know, but it's just about mining the data, mining the gold. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Um, my question will be, uh, I hope not open-ended, it's more related to engineering. So my, my, I'm coming from oil and gas, so also big capital projects, uh, expensive assets, and I'm in charge of like data science department now. Uh, but we are not that big as GE, okay? So we operate ships, we have like 120 ships in our fleet. And so I sit with CEO, CEO, and he comes and tells me, okay, uh, I want to do condition-based maintenance on, like, let's say, our engine. So let's say for a company of our size, we might have like only 20 engines, and we don't have all of those fancy sensors all over the place, so we can measure at what state a machine was before it broke down, okay? Uh, G most probably has that opportunity to have a lot of fancy sensors. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, the question I want to ask you, uh, for a company not of a GE size, what do you no think? No one is GE size. I mean, that's not going to hurt that. Like, there is boy, there is boy, there is boy, there is boy. So for a normal, sensible size company, okay? Yes. <laughs> uh, what do you think is the best way to go to digitization? Because you know, putting sensors all over the place that might be not very practical in terms of uh, the capital cost for the companies of smaller size, but what do you think is the most efficient way to go? And I'm having a meeting with you next week, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm giving you a pitch for next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so let me start with, okay. so I work with you right now. Okay. <laughs> so the easiest way to start, and 
this is what we work with customers in the same situation, is digitize your locks. So right now, every failure, the operator that's operating any piece of equipment has to log why this failed and basic information on how he started up again. That's the ABC of operation. If that's not done, then you need to change your operators. Uh, the very first step is just digitize that in an Excel format, in whatever simplest matter, and start adding tags to it. So that integrates to metadata. So things like, hey, it failed because this temperature increased and then that vibration increased. Things like that that are very, very trivial and it's already done. You need to train your operators on how to build that metadata. And that, that is easy, easily mineable data afterwards. So once you have that, you will be able to understand, hey, after this much hours, which is again an operator entry log, is it started on this date, it kept on running, failed on this date because of this failure. So things like that, you start logging in and you start building some basic analytics on that and basic predictive analytics on that. And then we can have a follow-up and discussion afterwards so that we get the team and give you better and more ideas on that. You have one week. Yeah. One week, huh? Yeah. <laughs> 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 by the way, since you mentioned that, I think that's really pretty much applicable to any industry. Because let's say in media, you have different gauges, something, let's say, uh, like your, uh, like analysis of Twitter feed will be your temperature gauge, that would be your pressure sensor. So I think that's uh, that kind of principle might be applicable to other industries as well. Thank you for the answer. 100%. Thank you. Any other question? Thank you. Thank you for the talk. I mean, you brought up the example of, um, of uh, the mall operator taking your data, and it's kind of a scary thought. But is there really an escape? And on a private level and on a business level, I mean, even if I look at a business, I cannot just develop my own CRM or my own, you know, uh, accounting program or whatever it is I'm using now on the cloud. I'm actually exposing my data and my business data to other providers that are using it for other purposes or to learn more about me, about my competitors, and they're actually building up the muscle that I'm providing them the information for. But do you really think there's any escape of that or we just live with the reality and just give away uh, everything? I think, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I think it's a, it's a little bit of reality and, and of course you, you can uh, protect yourself as much as you can by keeping your core data aside, you know, don't share your core data or especially your algorithms or your insights and you need to, uh, to, to think about it, even the biggest company in the world like an Amazon, the reason why I love Amazon is because Jeff Bezos put his soul inside the algorithm. If you know, he has a few secrets in his algorithms, that's really personal and nobody sees that. But you need to go very, very deep to see how it organizes this business. And that's why it, it, it's protected. So he has a protection layer about it. But I think if you want to protect yourself, you need to think about what your competitor is doing and what's really the insights about why they're doing it. I gave you the example about the Dubai Mall. But that's not even the real reason. You know, that's one part of the reason. Because everybody knows who the owner of the Dubai Mall is. So you think about it. If he knows what you're buying, he can redirect you to his favorite website. He can tell to all the retailers <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah. he, he can tell to all the retailers, you know, if, I, if you don't pay me more rent, I will make sure that that consumer will go to that store through that special promotion. So there are many different business model people are thinking about here, you're not even aware of why they're doing it. You know, and that's really what you need to figure out. You need to figure out what's the competitor doing, why you're doing it, and then make sure that in which angle you are in which business model you're in and concentrate on that. Okay, I'll, I'll just add one last thing. Okay, so coming back to retail, I see two models in my 20 year career what digitalization does. And that is, you create an automation framework and you become a marketplace, which is pretty much what most of the big players are, they're marketplaces. Or you become something as a service. Typically what's happening is there is no middle in a digital world. And let me give you an example. Uh, Alibaba is now has the biggest stake in Wanda. Wanda is a cinema house in China. You probably, if you watch the World Cup, you saw Wanda sponsorship. Now you know, it's a cinema house. Wanda, plus buying the biggest ticketing agency in India, 
Alibaba now has access to one third of the total population in the world from a ticketing point of view. What is he going to do to cinema? He may go the automation route. He could do pop-up cinemas or local cinemas. You can walk in with your mobile phone, which is tagged that you've come through the shop. You may have got your own popcorn. You sat down in your own seat, and you may not have had to, if you really want to, <laughs> speak to anyone. <laughs> that's one, that's the automation model. What are you doing here? You're ripping out costs, you're ripping out the human element, and you're giving the floor price point entry through automation. The other scale is the long tail of the business person. So this is a really good point that we end on this note because it's about family businesses. <laughs> family businesses can compete on service quality. So if you look at the cinemas here, you've got a buzzer or a butler. You can have a five course meal. You can have a purple velvet uh, blanket in your reclining leather seat. And maybe we might get to the point where you can control the air conditioning of your own seat and whatever else service you want around that experience. So what's happening with entertainment? It's now entertainment as a service. So there's automation with little human intervention. We will have to have this because there will be too many people who are on very, very low salaries and we need that infrastructure in society and then you will have the upselling small market size, but you have to maximize per basket of goods per customer that you have. And I really, I've seen industries fall because I've been in digital media seeing these industries and I used to have to help them to say, how do you bridge into digital? That is really what is ahead of us. Do you have one more question? for like startups that need that data to get going. Okay, so first of all, so I used to work in the UK for 20 years, and I'm Canadian, but I'm British too, so I'm on GDPR. <laughs> so if any, anyone in the room has not heard of GDPR, it stands for the General Data Protection Regulatory Framework, which is basically a consent framework for the use of data. But I'm not gonna tell you the legal framework, I'm gonna tell you, because I work in media, what I explain to a 19 year old who really doesn't care about the law, he might be hungover, apologies for those of you who don't drink, and he has a million dollar dog food account that he needs to do the advertising for. Okay, so let's say you are having a party in your house, and I knock on the door, we're friends by the way, what's your name? Monica, we've been friends for a long time. So I knock on the door, you open it up, I say, hey Monica, I'm so happy to be here. By the way, I brought some friends with me. Oh, actually, no. I only know you, Lily, and you know these two. I don't know them. I've never met them until tonight. And we're all gonna come into your house. And unfortunately, one of us, I'm not gonna say who, or maybe even two of us, made a few phone calls and a few other friends show up at the house, and things happen in your house that you didn't consent to, may have involved some issues. Maybe the police are called. Maybe we spilled something on your carpet, ruined your couch, broke your furniture. Who's at fault and who's responsible? We're a first party relationship. She was allowed into your house on a second party relationship. <laughs> These guys are third party to you. The GDPR is saying these guys came into your house, you didn't know them, they had access to, they, unfortunately, no offense, went into rooms maybe that were off limits for the party, and, and you, what, what it's saying is before we even come into your house, you're saying, okay, you can come into my house, but you need to know you've got access to the dining room, the living, living room, the kitchen, the upstairs is off limits, and don't even think about going into my basement. If you can consent to this, then you can come into my house. That is really what GDPR is about. And it's, it's about the permissions that different groups of people are being, or companies, are being given about what they're doing in that house. I hope that helps explain. I know it, like it sounds frightening, but when you go, no, 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 that's my house and I don't know you, what are you doing here? And so 
The challenge, though, is that in the media world, for example, what's happening is, let's say I, uh, my house is NBC.net, as an example. Right now, I can see there are roughly 50 different tracking technologies running on that website out of a possible 2,000 tracking companies worldwide that are being tracked. And um, our sales house is another company. The sales house is given access to the data companies to see what the audiences are doing on our website. Who is responsible if information is passed to places where there is not a form of consent? And so what's happening is the companies like Google, this is where it gets really interesting. I say Google is the catering company. And they're saying, hey man, I just provided the food. <laughs> what you do with it and how you eat it, that's not my business. And so what they're doing is the relationship they have in the, the mix is they're passing the responsibility back onto the house owner. Okay? Now our sales house that has the par partnerships, I call them the events management company, and maybe they did too much social media marketing, <laughs> and there are a lot of gate crashers. We, we as businesses, we have to decide who owns what responsibility in that relationship. So in the EU, they're just saying grow up. In China, they're saying um, the government owns pretty much most of the data. The USA, it's, it's an individual civil liberties for you to decide you know, what you do and, and how privacy is managed. I hope that answers your question. Thank you for explaining that because I always press I accept. So uh, <laughs> I'm gonna go back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm gonna have to go back to that. Now to wrap up the panel, we started with the quote that said clarity is power. And I think what we understood here, clarity in our business, but also in our personal information. Like how can we really use this data for our own benefit and not also share too much? And the good news is, we don't think intuition and AI and machine learning is going to replace us. So that's one of the good, I'm just trying to get the good, the good parts of it. Uh, I wanted to thank you all the speakers and thank all the audience and uh, thank you.